Pan Am Flight 7. At 5.04 p.m. on November 8, 1957, Captain Gordon Brown radioed air traffic control in Honolulu to report the status of his flight from San Francisco. Brown was at the helm of a Boeing Strato Cruiser 377 named Romance of the Skies, operating as Pan Am Flight 7, ferrying 38 passengers and 8 crew members across the Southern Pacific. He relayed that he was cruising at 10,000 feet with a 14 mile per hour headwind and promised to check in again at 6 p.m. Those were his final words to the outside world. When Brown failed to reach out to ground control at 6 p.m., initial concern was minimal. Pilots occasionally missed their check-in times, but by 6.30 p.m., the plane remained silent. 90-minute silence was unusual, prompting Pan Am controllers to report the situation. By 8 p.m., emergency protocols were activated, and the U.S. Coast Guard was alerted that Flight 7 had vanished. The search operation began with four surface vessels, two submarines, and several aircraft deployed from Honolulu. As days passed without any sightings, the search fleet expanded to include over 30 aircraft and 14 ships. On November 14th, a Navy search plane spotted bodies and debris floating in the water, marking the location of Flight 7. Nineteen victims were recovered, fourteen were in life jackets, one was still buckled into a seat, and none wore shoes. This evidence suggested that passengers and crew had some warning before the crash, yet it remained unclear why the wreckage was found 90 miles off the planned course. Wristwatches stopped at 5.27 p.m., indicating the crash happened just 23 minutes after Captain Brown's last communication. Some bodies and wreckage bore signs of fire damage, and others mysteriously showed signs of carbon monoxide poisoning in their bloodstreams. Investigators would officially state that there was no apparent cause for the crash. However, new theories have emerged following decades of private research aided by collaboration on the internet, with one major theory suggesting the plane might have been sabotaged. Researcher Ken Fortenberry, son of the flight's second officer, pinpointed two suspects, Eugene Crosswaite, the flight's head steward, and William Payne, a former Navy frogman with demolition training. Payne, who had mentioned traveling to Honolulu to settle a debt that cost less than his flight ticket, had secured a large life insurance policy shortly before the flight. A witness later stated that Payne had shown him explosive black powder in the days leading up to the flight. Crosswaite was known to harbor resentment towards Pan Am for issues that had occurred during his employment, and he had updated his will and left it in his car on the day of departure. His stepdaughter, Tanya Crosswaite, later disclosed to Fortenberry that her stepfather had been in a severe mental decline before the flight. Other experts, like Greg Herkin, argue for a mechanical failure, noting the Boeing 377 Strato Cruiser's history of propeller issues. This model had previously crashed in the Amazon in 1952, and another incident in 1956 involved engine failure and an ocean landing, resulting in four deaths. Without further evidence, the true cause of Pan Am Flight 7's crash, claiming 46 lives in 1957, remains speculative. Stardust Stendek Quote, ETA Santiago, 1745 hours, Stendek. At 5.41 p.m. on August 2, 1947, radio operators in Los Cerrillos Airport in Santiago, Chile, received this message via Morse code from BSAA Flight CS-59, a British airliner coming from Buenos Aires with 11 people on board. The plane, more commonly known as Stardust, was piloted by Dennis Hamer, who advised Los Cerrillos that the flight would be landing in four minutes, followed by the solitary cryptic word Stendek. These would be the last words heard from the flight. It never landed. For 50 years, the fate of the plane and its passengers remained a mystery, as did the meaning of Stendek, spelled S-T-E-N-D-E-C. The world had been rocked by the Roswell affair only a month earlier. One popular theory was that the aircraft had been abducted or destroyed by a UFO, with Stendek even becoming the namesake of a Spanish UFO-focused magazine. Others theorized that the plane had been carrying classified documents from the British government and was intentionally destroyed. In 1998, the fate of Stardust was finally revealed when two Argentinian hikers stumbled across airplane wreckage and shreds of human clothing on the Tupungato Glacier in the mountains neighboring Santiago. A follow-up army expedition in 2000 found more wreckage and several bodies, confirming the site as the final resting place of the long-lost Stardust. 
The frigid conditions of the glacier preserved the bodies remarkably well, enabling scientists to extract genetic samples in 2002. Eight of the victims were British, and five were identified via genetic testing, providing their families with long-awaited answers about their fate. Examination of the propellers and other wreckage indicated that the plane had been flying at near cruising speed without its wheels deployed at the time of the crash. This led to the theory that the crash was not due to an attempted emergency landing, rather flying in whiteout conditions and misjudging their location because of a strong jet stream. The crew of Stardust descended too early, directly into the side of the mountain. One final mystery remains, the meaning of Stendek. Almost 80 years after it was first transmitted, the meaning of this enigmatic word still baffles researchers. A wide range of theories have been proposed, including hypoxia-induced dyslexia, Morse code transcription errors, and complex acronyms, but all have been deemed as implausible as any other explanation. One theory suggests that Pilot Hamer, a World War II veteran who had flown numerous missions with the RAF, was transmitting a desperate warning using a wartime code. Severe turbulence encountered, now descending, emergency crash landing. While more plausible than other theories, this explanation contradicts the lack of evidence for an emergency landing at the crash site. It suggests Hamer had enough time to realize the flight was in peril and sent an outdated wartime code instead of the conventional SOS message while flying in whiteout conditions. Without new revelations, Stendek will continue to be the last unresolved mystery of the tragic story of Stardust. The Ghosts of Eastern Airlines Flight 401 On December 29, 1972, Eastern Airlines Flight 401 crashed in the Florida Everglades. The crew, preoccupied with a faulty indicator light, inadvertently disabled the autopilot without realizing it. Although the pilots eventually noticed the change in altitude, it was too late. 101 of the 176 people on board lost their lives in the disaster. The location of the plane and the crash itself are not shrouded in mystery. However, accounts from other Eastern Airlines crews suggest that the spirits of those who perished that December night may not have been laid to rest with the bodies they once inhabited. When cleanup crews began sifting through the wreckage, they found that the swamp's mud and water had cushioned the Lockheed L-1011 Tristar's impact, leaving many usable parts and accessories at the crash site. Eastern Airlines allegedly opted to recycle and reuse everything possible from the wreckage, incorporating these pieces back into their fleet as repairs and replacements. Within weeks, Stories began circulating within the Eastern Airlines fleet about two ghosts from Flight 401 appearing on various planes, Captain Robert Loft and flight engineer Don Repo. On one occasion, Loft's spirit was seen sitting in first class, donned in his pilot's uniform. The plane's captain recognized Loft immediately, and the apparition quickly vanished. A flight attendant on another Eastern Airlines flight witnessed Loft when she opened an overhead bin and saw his face staring back at her. While Loft's appearances seemed random, Repo Spirit allegedly issued warnings to flights in danger. Three flight attendants claimed to have seen Repo's face in the oven door of a plane, warning them of a potential fire on board. During its return journey to JFK, that aircraft did suffer an engine failure that nearly led to a fire, but disaster was averted thanks to the flight crew's prompt response. The stories of the two ghosts became so widespread among employees that Eastern Airlines eventually made telling ghost stories a fireable offense. Nevertheless, the claims that the ghosts only appeared on flights containing pieces of Flight 401 were taken seriously, and the company reportedly removed these pieces from the fleet. This action was followed by a cessation of the ghost sightings, leaving people to wonder whether the ghosts of Robert Loft and Don Repo were merely figments of frightened imaginations, or if they had truly haunted the Eastern Airlines fleet. Still, a company historian later insisted that the tales of ghosts and recycled parts were merely urban legends. Boeing 727 and 844AA. On the evening of May 25, 2003, Ben Padilla and John Mutantu boarded Boeing 727 and 844AA at Quattro de Fevereiro Airport in Angola. The plane had been previously used for shipping fuel to mining operations in the area, making this trip appear no different at first glance. However, the plane should never have taken off that day. Neither of the two men was qualified to fly it and no flight had been scheduled. Shortly after it took off, the 727 disappeared, and neither it nor the men were ever seen again. So what happened to N-844AA? Originally built in 1975, the plane had spent 25 years as part of the American Airlines fleet, and upon retirement, 
It ended up as part of the leasing fleet owned by Aerospace Sales and Leasing Incorporated. The company's president, Maury Joseph, then leased the 727 to a South African company tasked with delivering fuel to Angolan diamond mines. After that venture failed, the 727 was left abandoned for several years in Angola, a battered and gasoline-stained shadow of its former self. Despite the lack of overall maintenance, the plane's engines were still in good condition. To get the plane flyable, Joseph hired Ben Padilla, who had worked with him twice before. Although Padilla was knowledgeable about airplanes and a certified pilot, many remember him for his unpredictable personality and lack of self-control. Upon his arrival in Angola in November 2002, he hired John Mutantu as a mechanic. Everything seemed to be going well until that fateful day the following May, when the two men and the aircraft took off and disappeared. When the disappearance was reported, American intelligence agencies considered potential terrorism as a prominent concern. With the capacity to hold 10 500-gallon fuel barrels in the cabin, the jet could have been turned into a massive bomb if Padilla and Mutantu had filled the barrels before departure. As the days and weeks passed without incident, fears of terrorism were replaced with suggestions of insurance fraud. Joseph had a history of conducting dubious business practices, and the plane was in such bad shape that several agents following the case believed he had paid Padilla and Mutantu to help him pretend it had been stolen. However, Padilla's family holds a different theory. They believe the two men were either killed or imprisoned by kidnappers hiding on the 727. Padilla's brother and sister have acknowledged his personality flaws, but maintain that he was incapable of something as immoral as insurance fraud, and that he would rather have died than been involved in terrorism. They cite the men's departure without communication with the air control staff, and the absence of any subsequent sightings of the plane on area runways, as evidence that Padilla and Mutantu were either held against their will or killed when they entered the plane. To this day, no one knows what happened to N-844AA, though experts note that the aircraft was small enough to land on many of the unmarked dirt runways scattered across Africa. L-8 Ghost Blimp On August 16, 1942, the military blimp L-8 appeared in the skies over Ocean Beach, California. The blimp had taken off from San Francisco on a military patrol earlier that day. However, as it approached the shore, it became evident that something was amiss. The aircraft bounced off the ground at Ocean Beach, sustaining noticeable damage, before drifting back over San Francisco. The blimp ultimately crashed on Bellevue Avenue in Daly City, prompting a rapid response from rescue crews. What they discovered was more shocking than any conceivable injury. The blimp was empty. The two-man crew had vanished. Initially, the absence of Lieutenant Ernest Cody and Ensign Charles Adams from the blimp caused only mild concern. The crash had been relatively gentle, and it seemed plausible that the two men had simply walked away before the arrival of rescue teams. However, a search of the surrounding area quickly dispelled this notion. More extensive searches yielded no trace of them, and they were declared missing on August 18th. There had been no distress signal, the engines were functioning properly, and the life raft and parachutes intended for emergency use remained on board. The official investigation concluded that the blimp had not been damaged by enemy fire, suffered a mechanical failure, or undergone any standard emergency evacuation. Essentially, Cody and Adams had inexplicably disappeared. The official explanation posits that the men perished during a routine smoke marker deployment procedure. After opening the rear hatch to deploy the marker, one man slipped and inadvertently dragged the other out in his attempt to assist. Some speculate the Japanese soldiers captured the men, but how they were captured and why the Japanese would have sent the balloon back seemed to be inexplicable. Others suggest that the men attempted to desert and that their plan somehow went awry. An obscure theory even proposes that the men were overcome by radiation from an experimental radar system installed in the balloon and fell out, though no record of such equipment being installed in any L-class blimp has been found. If you could get the answer to only one of these aviation mysteries, which one would it be? Let me know in the comments. As always, thank you for watching Dark Five. Like and subscribe to continue exploring the greatest mysteries of this world and beyond.